I'm going to discuss uh, a quick shunt calculations. This is not a um, comprehensive review of shunt, but this is a quick shunt, quick tips about shunt calculations. So I give you a case. This is a 70 year old female with a late inferior MI presentation, four days that was not revascularized. She presents with ventricular septal rupture on echo with left heart failure clinically. I want to give you the number and just uh, discuss how to make the math. So her SVC saturation is 39%. Her PA saturation is 80%. And her arterial O2 saturation is 95%. So I want you, based on those three simple numbers, to come up with an answer to those three questions. Those are the three basic questions you ask yourself every time you assess for shunts. So one, is there a significant step up? And to do a screening for shunt, you look at the SVC sat and the PA sat. And what is a significant step up? You need to know that number. It's 8% or more. And here you have way more than 8%, you have 41%, but we consider it significant 8% or more. The second question, how to calculate QPQS shunt ratio quickly? I want you to know that QPQS, you calculate it by taking, you have three numbers, as we see PA and arterial SAT. Arterial SAT is usually, you know, normally 95 to 100%. So you take that 95, whatever number it is, 95% here, minus the lower number divided by 95 minus the higher number. So it's 95 minus 30, 39 divided by 95 minus 80. And the ratio comes up as 3.7. Over 1.5 is moderate, over two is large shunt, left to right shunt. So QPQS in this case, so it's very easy to calculate. I want you to know that simple equation. The third idea is how to tell if you have right to left shunt. So we mentioned left to right shunt is a step up. Left to right, you get a step up between SVC and PA. Now, how can you tell if there is a right to left shunt? One way, that's like you do on the, in left to right shunt is to say that there is a step down between the pulmonary venous pressure, uh, pulmonary venous or oxygen saturation and the arterial O2 saturation. But we're not doing transeptal puncture and we're not sampling the pulmonary veins. So one way of telling is, are you hypoxic? So if you're not hypoxic, if your O2 sat is over 95%, then you do not have right to left, left shunt, and which this is the case of most cases we do uh, in adult patients. Okay, so this patient, 95%, no right to left shunt. Now, of course, being hypoxic does not mean that you have right to left shunt. It could be hypoxia because of pulmonary edema, because of COPD, sedation, obesity. So if you're hypoxic, ask the patient to take a few deep breaths and give him oxygen. If that hypoxia improves, then it's not right to left shunt. If that hypoxia goes up to over 95% with one to two liters of oxygen and deep breath and waking him up, this is not right to left shunt. So that's how we assess for right to left shunt, okay? So those are the three simple steps in any shunt. I want you to know them, especially that simple calculation, 95 minus the chamber, uh, the, the SVCO2, divided by 95 minus PaO2, okay? If you have no questions, I'll just give you the rationale for this. Uh, you know, the bottom line is this equation comes from those equation I explained, the quick one, comes from the FIC equation. It's QPQS, QP is, or let's say QS, the systemic blood flow is that FIC equation, which is cardiac output, systemic cardiac output, O2 consumption divided by arterial O2 sat minus mixed venous O2 sat, which is best represented by SVC O2. Conversely, QP is O2 supply divided by pulmonary venous O2 minus PAO2. O2 supply and O2 consumption are the same. Whatever the lungs supply, 
is what is consumed by the body. So those are the same, or to consumption or to supply. And for everyone in the thick equation, when it comes to O2 sat, you use the inflow and the outflow chamber. In the, system, in the systemic circulation, the inflow is the artery, outflow is the right atrium. For the pulmonary circulation, the inflow is the PA and the outflow is the pulmonary vein. Actually, the same concept is used when you're calculating vascular resistance. You pick which pressure to choose based on that inflow and outflow. For PVR, the inflow is the PA, outflow is the LA. Okay, so everybody understood how, and then you do QPQS, you eliminate the O2 consumption and you come up with this. And SAO2 being equal to PVO2 in the absence of shunt, you come up with that simple equation. 95 minus mixed venous O2 divided by 95 minus PAO2, okay? So this patient, what we did on her, I'll give you a follow-up, we end up putting a balloon pump, okay, for ventricular septal rupture. And this is what happened when we placed the balloon pump. The SVCO2 went up to 56%. And uh, the PSAT kind of stayed the same. So what happened when we did a balloon pump? Why did we have a change in this? And what's the QPQS right now? So when we place the balloon pump, the QPQS is now 95 minus 56 divided by 95 over 78. QPQS improved from 3.7 to 2.3. Why is that? Is more forward flow rather than across the septum. Exactly. So the balloon pump increased the left-sided flow. You have reduction afterload. You get more sucking from the left side, less shifting toward the right ventricle. So we reduce the left to right shunt. Okay. So that's one explanation why the QPQS is low. You're reducing left to right shunt, and therefore you're getting much less or to step up because you have much less left to right shunt. That's one. Second, you're increasing the left flow, therefore you're increasing the oxygen supplies of the tissue, and therefore your mixed venous O2 saturation is not going to be as low. You're having better left-sided forward output, so the, your mixed venous O2 before the shunt will even be better. So you get better mixed venous O2 before the shunt, and you get less O2 step up because left to right, less left to right shunt. Another thing we found, this is the wedge pressure in this patient before the balloon pump. Severe, again, ventricular septal rupture uh, with severe shunt. You get massive V wave. And that's what I say, V wave is not specific for mitral regurgitation. You have massive V wave that almost reaches 60 millimeter of mercury. Now we place the balloon pump. Look how dramatic that, uh, that effect is. The V wave went down from almost 60, 55, to 30 millimeter of mercury. And this is something we notice. Balloon pump has much more dramatic effect in uh, septal rupture and in chronic decompensated heart failure than, I, than in really acute MI shock uh, without ventricular septal rupture. So the balloon pump has a dramatic effect in those patients, much more than acute MI shock. Uh, so keep that idea in mind. Those are the patients who benefit a lot from balloon pump. The acute MI shock without MR and septal rupture don't benefit too much from balloon pump as the balloon pump shock two trial showed. Conversely, septal rupture and chronic decompensated heart failure with shock, they do benefit more with balloon pump. So the chronic decompensated heart failure with shock is much more afterload sensitive than the acute MI shock and it benefits more hemodynamically at least. You get much more improvement in hemodynamics in that subset than in acute MI shock. This was shown in the ESAR shock trial. You didn't get much improvement in wedge pressure uh, with a balloon pump in acute MI shock, whereas in other studies in uh, decompensated heart failure shock, you do get more dramatic effect. Uh, acute MI shock also has some degree of vasoplegia in a substantial proportion of patients. Which, so it's more complex than the clamped chronic heart failure shock. Uh, well, I'll give in five minutes uh, and I will finish another case to illustrate shunts, okay? 
So this is 24 year old female with advanced albinon compaction and pre-transplant evaluation. She has mixed pulmonary hypertension. She's had multiple cath before, yet nobody diagnosed her with shunt. And here's one message. You have to always systematically in any right heart cath, sample the SVC and PA and screen for shunt. Even if nobody asks you to do that, it's part of your systematic evaluation. This patient had uh, seven or eight cath before nobody diagnosed her with shunt. When we did it, I diagnosed her with shunt because I sampled SVC and PA. So I found that she has a left to right shunt, over 8% step up between SVC and PA. And we, you can do a quick math. What is, the, what is her QPQS? 97% minus 64 divided by 97 minus 76. And it came up as it's 33 divided by uh, 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 22 or so. Anyway, it came up as 1.5, the shunt, okay? So she had a shunt. Uh, now, this is important because it could be contributing to her PVR because she has mixed pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension. So that shunt could be contributing to her PVR. So we did an O inhalation because we want to make sure is that a pulmonary hypertension reversible because before she can get transplant. Her PVR at baseline was still elevated over uh, three. So we gave her an O, and those are the numbers we obtained with nitric oxide treatment for 10 minutes. And here I want you to be able to do the math. Again, QPQS 100 minus 70 divided by 100 minus 88. So notice one thing with an O, you get much more O2 step up. At baseline, you had an O2 step up of 12. With nitric oxide, you get an O2 step up of 18%. So the QPQS has dramatically risen. The QPQS went from 1.5 to 2.5. Your left to right chunk has increased. I like you to assess those dynamic changes in left to right chunk based on what you do. So the prior case, I showed you what happens when you put a balloon pump. In this case, I'm showing you what happens when you do nitric oxide inhalation. In this case, you're increasing the light, uh, left to right chunk. And why is that? Why is nitric oxide causing more left to right shunt? Nitric oxide. Uh -huh. uh, so they're, you're dropping the, this selective, more selective pulmonary vasodilatation. So you're dropping the RV uh, pressure. So there is more shunting. Good. You're dropping the RV outflow, your RV out afterload. So with nitric oxide, you reduce the RV afterload. Therefore, you get uh, easier shunting from left to right because the RV has lower afterload and the RV pressure will drop potentially uh, in systole and diastole, and that will cause more sucking from the left side to the right side, okay? So that's why your left to right shunt increases with pulmonary vasodilation, And it's not unusual, A patient with, uh, elevated PVR and pulmonary arterial hypertension who are responsive to pulmonary vasodilator. If you have a left to right chunk, that left to right chunk can get exaggerated with pulmonary vasodilators, okay? Conversely, a right to left chunk will get attenuated with pulmonary vasodilator. So understand that process. Now, the question um, will be, and, and uh, when you're calculating PVR, so we gave nitric oxide and recalculated PVR, just make sure when you calculate PVR in those patients, do not use thermodilution. Thermodilution is one, it's dilute. The thermodilution will be falsely low because of the constant recirculation of the cold saline you're injecting. So that's one. More importantly, in those patients, you, know, you need to use QP calculated via FIC using the PA arterial SAT uh, in your equation. So you use the QP with PA arterial SAT. This is a SAT you pick for your QP, not the SVC SAT. So you need to use a QP calculation, then you calculate PVR in this patient. Do not use thermodilution. All right, so one may ask, should we close that chunk? It's 1.5 at rest. It gets worse with pulmonary vasodilators. I won't elaborate too much. We don't have time, but I would say definitely not. And the way you, you need to answer that question, whether you need to close that chunk or not, look at the RA pressure 
and look at the wedge pressure. So the patient's wedge pressure, which is LA pressure is 25, whereas her RA pressure is, you know, upper limit of normal. So that basically that left to right shunt is serving as a pop-off mechanism for the left atrium. It's 25 and eight. If you close that shunt, she will go into massive pulmonary edema that 25 will shoot up to 35, 40. So that left to right shunt, which across is PF, uh, PFO or more likely small ASD is serving as a pop-off mechanism for the left atrium. You cannot close it, okay? Uh, it will, again, it will cause uh, massive pulmonary edema. So you do not do it. The same way we don't close a shunt when you have a right, significant right to left shunt that's serving as a pop-off mechanism for a right heart failure. So like in Eisenmenger, we don't close the shunt because it's at this point it's serving to help release the pressure of the right heart, okay? So, Absolutely not in this patient. If the patient's pressure, left atrial pressure was normal, then that, and you had a QPQS of 1.5, then yes, you close it. But at this point, it's serving as a left, as a pop-off mechanism. Absolutely not, you do not close it, okay? It will aggravate her situation. And this is what we reported here. All right, I will stop here. Um, any questions?